and welcome once again to the Simpkins Physics Corner. I'm Mr. Simpkins. I am a science teacher in southeastern Pennsylvania. I've been teaching for almost a decade now, and I've been teaching in person since August. Our school's been open. Our students have been able to access our schools, but we're still in this hybrid model, and so I wanted to share some data and some information to answer the following questions uh, about COVID and school. So let's dive right into the actual numbers. Well, first of all, what are the consequences of school closures? Well, it's not hard to imagine that having all remote learning or only being in the building two days out of seven, a uh, seven day week is absolutely failing. All right, we have students that are just aren't showing up. Uh, we have we have students that are failing more classes than they ever have. I have some students that were great students before and they just aren't doing aren't doing well anymore. Um, and of course, we could have predicted that because the models we've set up have lack of structure or consistency, either between classes or teachers. Uh, unclear expectations. Uh, there's isolation. So our students, a lot of times, are just left at home by themselves to do the learning. There's a lack of access to necessary materials or technology. So some of my students would love to do the work, but their internet isn't reliable or they don't have the devices that they need. Of course, we also have these uh, consequences of school closures of mental health. Our, our kids that are 5 to 11 years old, the emergency room mental health visits have gone up 24%. And for 12 to 17 year olds, up 31%. That means they're so desperate in such a poor mental health state that, that the only place they have to go is the emergency room. And that's gone through the roof. And the other thing, we have a really important role as educators um, is to watch out for our students and to make sure they're in safe situations. It's estimated that in just the months of March and April, over 200,000 uh, child mistreatment allegations were unreported. And I can only imagine how many it's been as we continue to keep our schools closed. Now, you might say, well, it sucks that our schools are closed, but I've seen it go really poorly, right? Like in the school in Georgia where no one was wearing their masks and they had to quarantine like a thousand kids, right? Well, here's the thing. You didn't hear anything about that story after August, probably because the cases in the county went down for the next two months. So it turns out that the, the schools being open didn't cause an increase in cases in the county. And it actually also had no impact on COVID deaths. You can see here is uh, in August, when or they actually opened pretty early in August, and you can see that it didn't really have a, an increase or a decrease. It just kind of stayed the same as far as COVID deaths in the community. So um, do open schools cause increased community spread? You can look at anecdotes or you can look at large scale data. And the data is pretty much in on this. All right, Europe's already figured this out and we're kind of getting there. Uh, but it turns out that the positivity rates for students in schools is 0.076%. That's really small. Um, if we ask that first question, do schools cause increasing community spread? The evidence seems to indicate no. Why does it appear that cases in schools are increasing? Maybe you've, been, maybe you've been getting a lot of emails about cases in your schools. Well, for one, we're getting into that normal flu season, the, the uh, seasonality of the different times of year, depending on where you live. Um, but this is really important. The tests that we use most often are PCR tests. And the New York Times did a big article on this in August. So I'm going to get a little nerdy here, but this is important. And the reason it's important is because cases are being used as justification to force schools that have made the decision to let students learn in person, forcing them to go virtual or remote. So this is why what we call a case matters. So how does a PCR test work? Well, they swab your nose. We all know that gross part, right? And there's some viral DNA on there, but it's a really tiny amount. So they have to replicate it and replicate it and replicate it. And every time they replicate it or magnify it or amplify this amount of DNA, it's called a cycle. So as you can imagine, if you only have to run a few cycles, it's because you already have a lot of viral DNA on there and you're probably pretty infectious. If we look at a simple illustration of this, we can see that the more virus you have in your system, the fewer cycles you're gonna have to run and the more infectious you probably are, right? So if we look at this chart, Access labels matter. I always tell my students this. So you notice the CT, that cycle threshold, that's how many cycles they had to run. When you only run 25 cycles, you can culture live virus from 30 out of 44 of those samples. This is a small sample size, but it's illustrative. You notice though, when you get down here to 35 and 40 cycles, it's much harder to detect or replicate any live virus. And so what we find is that when you have less virus present, you have to run more cycles to find it, which means you have a lower viral load. Um, even Dr. Anthony Fauci himself said, if you run cycle thresholds, anything over seven, uh, 37, it's dead nucleotides, period, all right? And I don't just listen to one person because the logical fallacy of appeal to authority. So I actually went and found a systematic review uh, of many dif different studies. That's when they take not just one study, but they look at all the studies and they summarize it. This is from December, by the way. Uh, and they found that those PCR tests with high cycle threshold are unlikely to have infectious potential. All right. So here's why this matters, right? Because let's say a student's family member tests positive for COVID, maybe from work or they're out and about. Then the kid gets a, uh, a PCR test and they test positive. Well, now the school emails everybody and particularly kids that were in that student's class. And then they all go and get tests, right? Well, you might say, oh, well, it's good that we're testing them. But keep in mind, we're doing these PCR tests that are really sensitive. Now, what might you ask is the cycle threshold around where you live? Well, if I, uh, I looked up my labs and they run them at 38 and 40 cycles. 
as you can see by this chart, and if you understand the idea of how the cycles work, you are amplifying so much dead virus that, as Anthony Fauci would say, it's dead nucleotides, and you have very little chance of infecting everyone. But this gives the impression that COVID is spreading in schools because there's all these cases, positive PCR tests, coming out of our schools. So just a little context there for you. Now, you might say, well, it's good that we're testing them because asymptomatic spread, right? Well, the available data for asymptomatic spread, this is very recent, this is December 14th. There was, again, not, I'm not citing one study, I'm citing a systematic review. This is uh, 40, 54 studies over 77,000 participants. They found that in your house, the likelihood of you spreading COVID to a family member or somebody you live in your house with is 0.7%. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't wear a mask around my house. Uh, and so if, if you're in close quarters, breathing the same air with the people that you live with, and the chance of you passing it to them asymptomatically is 0.7%, I can only imagine how much less it is in school, which is a much more controlled environment. I don't have a number for you for that, but I would think it's pretty safe to say it's less than seven out of 1,000 chance, all right? especially when we have distancing and masks and all that. So here's the real question we have to consider. If we look at the risks of being in school, we know that there's smaller spread in schools than almost anywhere else in society. We have fewer cases than perceived if you, have, if you live in an area where the cycle thresholds are through the roof for PCR tests. And we know that we can probably safely say that the asymptomatic rate of spread in schools is less than it is in your house, which would be 0.7%, so very, very low. And we have to make the decision about whether those risks are so bad that we're okay with letting these things continue, with an increase in mental health issues, dropouts and failures, unreported child abuse, uh, the future learning losses, racial and socioeconomic inequalities, those are, are uh, exacerbated by these school closures, and of course, more sedentary lifestyle and long-term health issues. I can't imagine what it would be like. Actually, I can because I have family members who have second graders and they're just miserable on their computers for six or seven hours a day. Kids aren't made to do that. So um, what we have to ask then is do the statistical risks to students and community justify continuing to subject our students to those obvious and now demonstrable consequences? If you have found this information helpful, I want to empower you because parents, students, you actually have a lot more say than you might think. First thing it's easy to do is just share this video along to inform other people about what is the most current data about schools and COVID and how this all comes together. All right, but the second thing I really want to encourage you to do is to contact your principal, your school board members, and your superintendent. If they don't hear anything from you, they assume everything's going great. Now, a side note, if you do live in a place where your students are able to go to school, especially for five days a week, definitely reach out to these people, all right, because they have taken bold leadership action. They have stepped out and they've probably taken a lot of criticism, but they stuck to the data. They stuck to following the science behind this and they did the best they could to make the schools as safe as they could be. And they really need to hear from you uh, some words of encouragement. So that's the little green over there. And please do that. Uh, it's really important to establish those positive community relationships. And those people need encouragement because they're making some tough decisions up there. Um, but if you, uh, if you are in a place where you're not happy with what's going on, you know, maybe your child isn't able to go to school five days a week, uh, check out the bullet points here for things that you should, uh, you, you should share. Definitely share your, per your personalized, uh, childhood experiences, but ask them, you know, maybe share this information, this data with them. There's lots of links in this video. Um, and then you can say, hey, what do you think about this information? How is that in informing your school policy? Did you know? Maybe, maybe they know it, maybe they don't. Of course, always be polite, all right? Encourage them uh, for what they're doing well. Uh, but it's, it's okay. You're the taxpayer. You're paying the bills. It's okay to say, hey, you know what? Um, we're doing this and here's the data. And this is why uh, I think we should do the same or something different, whatever your opinion might be. Um, now, they might kick you to the county health board because a lot of the county health um, uh, organizations give rules to the schools. And so you can call them. I, I actually got a hold of the county health director uh, in the neighboring county. I was really surprised. He got back to me. Great guy. Um, and so a lot of these local officials, they are willing to listen. They're willing to respond. So I want to encourage you to stop just like ranting on Facebook or you know, posting memes to social media. You can actually do something about it by sharing this information with others and by contacting your local, uh, your local people, whether it's your principal, your superintendent, your school board members. So if you have any questions, give me a shout. But until next time, I'm Mr. Simpkins in the Simpkins Physics Corner. Happy New Year and happy rest of the school year.